Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. The three of us are sitting with the unfolding events of the times and thinking about the great arc of transformation that life imposes upon us. Jung thought greatly about his own process as well as the process of the culture. And if he were here today, he might say that we are all participating in a collective negredo, that something is emerging that is unexpected, that we weren't prepared for, that demands an accommodation, and that causes the death of all kinds of illusions, both collectively and individually. And how do we sit in that? Well... Maybe it, it seems like the first place to start is to just s start with that term and define it a little bit. Negredo is a term that comes from alchemy, which was a kind of a medieval young belief, sort of a spiritual practice that, that later became chemistry, actually. But Jung was fascinated by alchemy because the incredibly figurative language, these colorful metaphors that the alchemists wrote about as they worked with materials, he felt were metaphors for psycho-spiritual transformation. So the negredo was often referred to as a black, blacker than black. Yeah, it sounds so mystical. Um, the black, blacker than black of the, the darkness and that place also where there there's no light, but it's also associated with the incubation process, uh, likened to pregnancy that takes place unseen within in a blackness, or a seed beginning to germinate in the blackness of soil. So it's associated with a kind of, at least an opportunity uh, for a beginning. I don't know that it's restricted to that, but um, it often appears at the beginning of psychological work. And I think we see that a lot of people come in because they're in a life crisis under Grado. What that brings to mind to me, Deb, is that there are times in our lives where we begin to get the sense that something very, very important is about to take place, but it hasn't landed yet. And there's a kind of pressure that begins to thrum in the personality, sometimes even in the body, in the emotions, which gives us a kind of anxious sense of you know, something bigger than us that's arriving. Aren't we in a kind of place like that right now, collectively, mm -hmm. of that we are in a kind of darkness? We're isolated, secluded, hopefully, many of us anyway, in our homes, and yet uh, there is that sense of um, anxiety and what next and where are we going? Yeah. And, you know, I think it's important to not wander too far away from the fact that the negredo is associated with suffering. You know, Jung at one point talks about it being analogous to this uh, mystical idea of the dark night of the soul. I mean, it, it may be where something new is germinating, but boy, it sure does not feel like that. It, it, it more feels like the, um, the, the death and the rotting away of everything that uh, we previously clung to. And that's why it's also associated with the alchemical operations of mortificatio and putrefactio. I think that there are subcategories around the degrado which, by the way, is, is just a Latin word for black. And you know, when we look at a piece of fruit or any kind of natural process, a leaf falls from a tree and it loses its 
greenness and eventually rots down into the blackness of soil, that it, it suggests that there's a kind of natural process that's occurring. But there are subcategories. So the negredo, the mortificatio, and the putrefactio. So this idea of something turning black, something beginning to die, and then something beginning to rot. That they're all in this category of Saturnine decay. But I think the negredo is thought of as the initial part of that, which for Jungian work can be the confrontation with the shadow. Absolutely. Um, And there's so much about that, uh, that it's a subjectively experienced process brought about by the subject's painful growing awareness of his shadow aspects. And it does, I think, uh, take us by surprise, uh, just as this pandemic has taken us by surprise. Where did this come from? How could it uh, came out of nowhere, it seems, um, in its suddenness and its all-encompassing quality on the collective front? And individually, it takes us over as well. Yeah, there, there is a sense of uh, no stable ground it yeah. isn't there. And I think that, that there's a way that when something so big is going on in the collective right now, as with the, uh, the pandemic, you know, just like I imagine, uh, you know, a world war would feel this way too. It just feels like, you know, everything is suddenly tossed up in the air. There's no, we have no stable footing. We don't know what's going to happen. And it, it brings about this, well, it can lend itself to a reorganization of the personality where everything kind of comes into question. But I want to just back up for a second. Deb, you were talking about this confrontation with shadow, and there's a really uh, lovely quote from from Jung in uh, Collected Works 14 that speaks to this. He says, self-knowledge is an adventure that carries us unexpectedly far and deep. Even a moderately comprehensive knowledge of the shadow can cause a good deal of confusion and mental darkness since it gives rise to personality problems, which one had never remotely imagined before. For this reason alone, we can understand why the alchemists called their negredo melancholia a black, blacker than black. So when we think about the darkness versus the lightness, or the black versus the sunniness of the personality, most of us create a a sense of self and a sense of outer personality, outer persona, that allows us to seem, you know, kind of bright and appealing and congruent with the norms of the culture. And when the negredo, when the shadow begins to roil, all of a sudden, those pretty and nice elements of the personality begin to become challenged at the very least. I'm thinking about a lot of YouTube videos running around of people lunging at rolls of toilet paper. And although, I mean, that's become a point of comedy and scorn, at the same time, if we think about being one of those people racing to the shelves to greedily or desperately grab, you know, 48 rolls of toilet paper, and then later that day sitting down quietly and thinking, I'm that person? I'm like the person that elbowed the old lady to grab the 48 rolls of toilet paper and scurry them into my car and asking, where do I put that image of myself? And yet, there it is. I'm thinking of a sort of uh, fictionalized case here, you know, of someone who maybe is mid-career and and uh, very well established and finds that, you know, Partly as a result of the disruption of the pandemic, he falls in love with his colleague who's much junior. And, and, you know, this has never been something he would ever have thought would happen. And he is, um, this was never in his value system to, to cheat on his wife or have an affair. And, and this is, you know, sort of the wrong thing to do for all kinds of reasons. And yet he, he just is sort of tempest tossed with these uh, wild desires that seem to be propelling him to go in this completely new direction. 
that is like a negredo place. And it, it has to do with the dissolution of old forms, things that used to work and hold us up and contain us and give us direction and meaning now suddenly just feel like they've been swept away or they've been melted down. And we're left really confronting ourselves and wondering, who the heck are we? I think that speaks so poignantly to exactly what a confrontation with shadow feels like, uh, whether it's your example, Joseph, of the person that scoops up uh, lots and lots of toilet paper in desperation or, or greed or whatever it is. And then uh, what do we do with that later? Or your person, Lisa, who has to uh, realize uh, that there's an attraction that doesn't really fit with what he had thought was his morality system, of that there's a death of, of our illusion about who we thought we were that ties into what you talked about, Joseph, the persona of, of I'm a nice person, I, I'm good to people, I, I feed my cat, I do, you know, all these nice things. And then what really we're called to do is when we get home that night or home from the grocery store is to uh, confront that part of ourselves that is n not what I wanted to be. Uh, look at what I have done, uh, what I have said, this illicit or seemingly illicit relationship, uh, the hoarding of whatever it might have been from the grocery store. That is part of who I am. I think that's the key. Yeah, it's the way that realizing you're really having to own your shadow just kind of melts you down. It, it is a, a real and terrible disillusionment that I am not all those things that I thought I was. And, and the, the point isn't to necessarily remonstrate with oneself of, oh, gee, I really shouldn't have done that. Uh, the, the point is to come to terms with that as an internal reality so that it doesn't have to be enacted. Of the, and Jung says we all have a thief and a trickster and a, probably a murderer and all these really dark things within, but if we can give them a place at the table of consciousness, then we are paradoxically freed up from having to enact all these things in the outer world. I agree with you, Deb, and having sat with someone who, you know, my fictionalized case, you know, I, I have sat with people going through things like that. And I just want to say that it's easy to jump to, well, if we just give it a place at the table, then we won't have to act it out. But when, when you're caught in this and you really, really say, want to leave your wife and go have the affair with a junior colleague, really are suffering it and there is no shortcut. I think an alchemical image that really captures that and I think it's one of the rosarium images is a, a vibrant muscular green lion that is chomping and eating the sun and saliva is dripping down from its mouth and that's a depiction of raw powerful, instinctive energies that have the capacity to take hold of the ego and gobble it down, like sink its teeth into it, that it's not a pretty process, it's not an abstracted process, but it, it feels like being chewed up by the passion to have an affair with the junior colleague or um, grabbing and hoarding things because we feel that our survival suddenly depends on it when we've always been a rather refined or elegant person. Any number of other behaviors. <laughs> and there's this terrible behavior that's happening where if somebody appears to be not complying with social distancing, this vigilante attitude is springing up in communities and individuals are harassing people like screaming at them if they're not following what the authority figures in the culture are telling them what to do. So this kind of shadow bullying is rising up in the culture. Now, one of the things that we do first when shadow rises is we often defend against it. Oh, that's not me. 
sometimes we'll literally forget that we did something because it's so incongruent with our view of ourselves. Sometimes within moments, we're projecting it onto another person and saying, they're the one that's doing it. I didn't do that. But the negredo begins when we have to put hands on the experience. And if the negredo is navigated successfully at the end, we can say, I am that. I am everything I have been, but I am also that. I, th I think I want to acknowledge my, both my predilection for optimism <laughs> and these confrontations with shadow that can become a negredo are a call to consciousness that we need to face the call to confront these blackened, hard, suffering confrontations with, with, with our dark side. And th that that's where uh, the, the real rub is, is I did that. I said that to somebody in line, I said, you know, who wasn't staying six feet away. I did that. And to take that in fully and reflect on it is really the call to uh, answering these difficult aspects of ourselves that we are confronting collectively and individually um, in the midst of this crisis. Uh, what is the next thing that I do with that? What do I do with it? Yeah. Do I even allow myself to have that confrontation and regret? And then what? Um, it, it is a call to acknowledge something in ourselves. Yeah, I, th I appreciate what you're lifting up, Deb, and, and this, this idea about the necessity of confronting it, you know, uh -huh. which to, to me is similar to saying that we have to suffer it. And, you know, we said uh, earlier that the negredo often occurs at the beginning of the work. And it was commonly understood that the work progressed in these three phases, the negredo, the albedo, and the rubedo. And I want to read just a little bit from Jung about where he talks about how the negredo becomes the albedo, because I think that's kind of where we are right now in the conversation. He says, the work is difficult and strewn with obstacles. The alchemical opus is dangerous. Right at the beginning, you meet the dragon, the chthonic spirit, the devil, or as the alchemist called it, the blackness, the negredo, and this encounter produces suffering. In the language of the alchemists, matter suffers until the negredo disappears when the dawn will be announced by the peacock's tail and a new day will break, and that's the albedo. So it is the suffering that turns the blackness into the whiteness. I would add that it's the conscious suffering of that that makes it alchemical versus instinctive, perhaps, that we know what we're struggling up against. And so when we first begin to feel uncomfortable and aware that something is churning, but we don't know what it is. Jung referred to that as the emergence of the masa confusa, which is a word I throw around all the time. Masa <laughs> confusa. You, you like saying that, don't you? Justin? I love saying it. It rolls <laughs> off the tongue trippingly. And it, it just so means poetic. it does. Uh, it's a big confusing mass. You know, and if we think about it as a big roiling cloud with all kinds of images just halfway poking out of it and all kinds of feeling and lightning bolts, you know, zinging around it that we come into this inner state where we're boiling, but we can't quite put our finger on the problem yet. And I think all of us can associate and remember moments at least where we felt that way. And if we can stay attentive to it and not go back to sleep, things begin to emerge, which we normally don't like to see in ourselves, but which can, by the way, be very valuable. And then we're on the path of change, if we can put our hands on it and not let it go. And Jung writes uh, very movingly about being in this place of the masa confusa and the negredo. 
and he went out in the morning and, and sat by the, the edge of the lake in Zurich and built little houses and so on. He was lost. And he said that he needed a support, a point of support in this world and that his family and professional work were that to me. And I think I want to offer that up as that there is also that in the Masa Confusa and in the suffering. What do you have? What needs to be done? You need to go out and get some groceries. Is there a meal to be prepared? Is there a phone call to be made? Is there a room to be cleaned? There's always a room to be cleaned. <laughs> <laughs> and he says his family and profession always remained a joyful reality and a guarantee that I also had a normal existence. Now, what is the next step? What is the next thing to be done? What can you put your hands on or put your voice to that you could do right now? In AA, the advice given is just to do the next right thing, which I, I really love that. It's very practical. When you're lost, you're confused, you're depressed, you're, you don't know which end is up. What is the next right thing to do? Even if it's just, you cleaning know. Cleaning the bathroom. Cleaning the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, but it's lovely. It's lovely and it's grounding. And I think we have lots of examples of that. You feel what you feel. And... Uh, what is the next right thing that you can actually do? I think that the image you're bringing forward, Deb, for me, rightly belongs to the albedo stage, and particularly one of the images of doing the laundry. <laughs> that I feel like in the conversation, we keep slipping out of the negredo into the next stage, because sitting in the negredo is hard, even in our conversation, to just circumambulate around this particular emergence of what we don't want to see. Not necessarily how we'll cope with it, not necessarily what comes next, but just in the discomfort of what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. That that actually is transformative. And if we solve it too quickly, I tend to become suspicious. And we can go into a cleverness, a clever solution, so that we don't have to feel uncomfortable and lots of therapies will do that very quickly. Oh, we'll do thought insertion. So don't think about that anymore and choose three thoughts that actually are comforting and relaxing. And every time you have the uncomfortable thought, just go to the comfortable thought and just shut that down. You know, I mean, there's a lot of advice around that. And, and the reason we like that advice is that we don't like being uncomfortable and nothing in us wants to suffer. So sitting in the negredo, is feeling that we cannot escape the reality that's emerging and that we must sit and brood on it and look at it and not go away to something else. And the question that, that I would ask is, what am I being brought down to? Yeah, I mean, I think one aspect of the negredo is that it feels in a, it does feel inescapable. You may want to escape it, but often you just really can't. You know, it, it, it punctures your defenses. And I like your question, Joseph, what am I being brought down to? It, there is a humiliation <laughs> that goes along with it often. We have to admit that uh, we thought we had it all figured out. And guess what? We actually don't. And I think that that is true on an individual level. And it's also true on a collective level. We we did not think we could be laid low like this, I don't think. That the global economy could just be cut off at the knees just by a virus. I, I think that's so important, Lisa. I think about just several months ago, this great debate in the United States between whether or not we should put more energy into the welfare state. And by that, I mean the social safety network. Should we fund universal health care? Should we strengthen Social Security or Medicare, Medicaid? You know, all of the safety nets of our culture. And that was met often with a kind of bravado that one would never need that. If you plan correctly, you should never be dependent upon some kind of an agency or anything that is governmental, that we're all kind of, you know, pioneers in the 1800s. And what's happening now with this sudden 
emergence of shadow. And one of the pieces of shadow is dependency. That there is this enormous feeling of vulnerability in the American psyche and dependency. And then this crying out for a kind of parental caretaking response from the government that was vilified just several months ago, even gleefully vilified. So this goes to your comment, Lisa, of the humbling that's required in this case to admit dependency and vulnerability. Yeah, and of course, this relates also to this idea of the relativization of the ego. And Edward Edinger, a Jungian analyst who wrote a great book actually uh, on alchemy, it's called Anatomy of the Psyche, Alchemical Symbolism and Psychotherapy. He talks about this concept a little bit in relation to the mortificatio and the negredo uh, around King Lear. He Early in the play, he is um, kind of so uh, sure of himself and so sure of his own authority. And over the course of the, of the drama, there's, he loses authority, power, and control. And then, of course, he loses his dear daughter. And he undergoes this total mortificatio and, of course, goes mad. But it's in this negredo that he is transformed because he gets a glimpse of the transpersonal psyche that he is now willing to serve. And I'm sort of, I've sort of been paraphrasing Edinger there, but I think that's a lovely example. Uh, and, and, and perhaps Joseph, you'll accuse me of slipping into the albedo, you know, kind of where, <laughs> where it goes. But, but I think, you know, it is always going somewhere too. Exactly. That's what I have been thinking about is um, how important it is to think about uh, where this might take us, and just to begin to uh, even imagine it, of uh, where where is the telos, where is the trajectory, as it's going, it's going somewhere, a- and that 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 doesn't necessarily negate the negredo. The, the image that I have is the image of Persephone, uh, who was abducted by Hades as she sat sort of in her. Um, innocent self as a young maiden uh, picking flowers in the field. And she went down to Hades and uh, spent, uh, different myths have different time frames, but let's say three months to six months down there. And I used to um, like to uh, kind of think about what, what did she do every day? So there she is in Hades, abducted, kidnapped, in darkness, and that's a great image of the Negredo. But down there, she had to be doing something. I always assumed she was having really hot sex with Hades. I was exactly <laughs> thinking that. That is not what I was thinking. Of, of course you were, um, Joseph. <laughs> uh, but I was thinking, did she wander the hallways? Did she light candles? Uh, did she talk to Tiresias, who was one of the dead who retained uh, some consciousness and wisdom? Um, she learned things down there. Because when she emerged, she was no longer Corey, the maiden that she had been. She was Persephone, queen of the underworld. And I'm thinking, okay, here we all are in a Negredo as a collective around the world, around the world, we're all in this. What is it that we need to learn about our individualistic uh, ego beliefs, uh, wants, the control we think we have over our lives? Uh, I'm a self-made man, uh, whatever those kinds of things might be. Um, or are we part of something greater, uh, something that has its its own life and its own laws, like Mother Nature, for example? Uh, what do we need to learn down, while we're doing this? And what are some of the steps that we can take um, as individuals? And they may be very mundane. And this descent that we go into this encounter with the personal unconscious also inoculates us relative to other stressors that are happening in the environment. That the more we are aware 
of our personal unconscious material through this uprising, through this self-acceptance, the less vulnerable we are to the negative collective unconscious forces which leach into us through those kind of gaping holes in the personality. And to that end, I have a quote from Jung in his Dream Analysis Seminars. He writes, When you come to that loneliness with yourself, when you are eternally alone, you are forced in upon yourself and are bound to become aware of your background. And the more there is of the personal unconscious, the more the collective unconscious forces itself upon you. If the personal unconscious is cleared up, there is no particular pressure, and you will not be terrorized. You will stay alone, read, walk, smoke, and nothing happens. All is just so. You're right with the world. That is a real inspiration for how to engage shadow, be in the negredo, uh, and have a kind of incubation or creative depression. Yeah, just to, to sort of be with it, you know, and, and there's a way that you can't fight the descent, really. I'm wondering if the three of us have anything to say about dreams that arise during a negredo. Have we seen that? Have you, have you, have you all seen that? I think any time an analysand dreams of something that they are defensive against, they're flirting with the negredo. And in that way, every dream is an opportunity for a negredo. Mm -hmm. For instance, I'm thinking about uh, one client sometimes back was having a dream and in the dream that he was feeling very defensive because a bunch of construction workers were wolf whistling <laughs> at a bunch of women and he was in this kind of outrage um this heroic solar outrage and that went on for a while and we processed it and then i said well you know those construction workers that are sexualizing these women and wolf whistling <laughs> them actually inside of you. So how, how often do you walk around the street and wish that you could wolf whistle or catcall to women and that that's so unacceptable that it gets put down? And then his face turned bright red <laughs> in that moment and fell silent. And that's a that's a Negredo moment. It's yeah, that that's great. That's shit. great moment where your dream has kind of tricked you into admitting something that is really uncomfortable. That's a great example of, of kind of what, what a little Negrito feels like. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> <laughs> there are small Negritos which are really important because they keep us human. Just as you were saying, Lisa, this idea of being humble and humiliated come from the root of the same word humus, which means soil. So it plants us down in the soil of the culture and the personality, which of course is a place we can derive nutrients from as well. I'm, I'm back on the uh, corollary between Negredo, Shadow, and um, the humbling, and our egos, you know, and our heads of what we want to believe, what we think is the way to go, um, uh, my plan for my life or my next promotion, and uh, how often this negredo is um, imaged as a decapitation, mm -hmm. uh, where things go uh, kaput, and that, um, th that it's the end, as in King Lear, of, of cogitatio, cogitation, thinking, ego, planning, that has to be literally cut off so that all these contents from the unconscious uh, have an upwelling and insist uh, that, we, that we pay attention, insist they take us over. And the image of the decapitation is interesting, Deb, because I think a lot of times this reaches to us from the body, 
Mm. You know, it's like our head is riding around all day thinking, I've got this. I'm totally in control. I know what I'm doing. But then maybe our body throws up a symptom or it gets sick or there's a, an instinctual pull towards something and it's like, whoa, and then we lose our head. Mm -hmm. Sometimes to good effect for a short period of time, because it's often in the head, in the certain area of the ego that we disavow parts of ourselves and then block a feeling of becoming whole eventually. Yeah, you know, Jung talks about um, the negredo as the great suffering and grief which nature inflicts on the soul. And hasn't that happened? Mm -hmm. uh, th that uh, something else is here something that is greater and something that our egos, as in dreams, you know, the dream ego says, you know, I would never wolf whistle at, peop at, at girls. I would never do that. But there it is, that our heads, our dream egos uh, say, no, no, not that. But we're confronted with it. And, and here we all are as a collective. We are confronted with this. And it is bodily, just as you said, Joseph, it's very bodily. This is a physical, natural happening. Now, all of the naturalness of the presentation of the shadow, I think, is happening in spades right now, partially because people are sheltering at home and they are separated out from their distractions and entertainments. So as I had mm -hmm. read in the quote from Jung, whether we're a single person, literally alone in the house, or we're just alone with our spouse or our family, that we are cast upon ourselves and we begin to feel the rumblings of the unlived life, the rumblings of parts of ourselves that we have very successfully kept quiet and locked away. And so much of the stream of stuff I see on Facebook are, the, are these complaints that people are having about being alone. And I'm listening really carefully to what's, what's rumbling in its cage, you know, under the ground in these various memes and the incredible lengths to which people are going to avoid all of that. So this is an opportunity for an enormous amount of, of growth. Yeah, I like your use of the term the unlived life, because I think that that, in a way, the unlived life is the shadow or is an aspect of shadow. And it is that that reasserts itself at times, and particularly at times of, of upheaval, either personal or collective, or if we think about it, when there's kind of a weakening of ego function for some reason, that's when the unlived life will poke through. And it's tumultuous, or it can be. As the inner zookeeper is falling asleep mm -hmm. and the creatures inside of us are breaking out of their cages. There is a dark side to the negredo, a darker <laughs> side to the negredo, I would say, is that when one is faced with unacceptable truths, there's a lot of different places that we can go with that. One of the things that people will fight with are suicidal urges which in alchemical language is sometimes called a lead mania. That the leadenness of the personality rises up to mm. such a state of horror that people begin to spin towards any kind of wild way of shutting it down. The most important thing to remember about the negredo is you must survive it. You know, in another way I'd like to talk about how people can escape into narratives uh, that, that simply are not based in fact. Uh, and that that is a refusal, you know, uh, of, the, of the call to suffer and the, a refusal of the call to give up illusion, a refusal to face shadow. And that we are called to face the reality of ourselves in a given situation uh, and see what is really objectively true 
and subjectively uh, what is happening, you know, inside ourselves. Um, I'm thinking about some of the stuff that uh, is out there on the internet that I've I've read about that are simply, you know, what I would call uh, conspiracy theories and various other things. Uh, we are called to face this and not defend, um, not construct fanciful storylines, and not evade uh, our inner and outer realities. If if you're in the Negredo, you really have no choice but to be there. Yeah, to, to really sit in it. Yes, we have been abducted. And the question is, what do we do with it? And everything we do, we do with ourselves. Uh, so it's a call to really take all of that into consideration. It's a call to what do I do with my uh, kids that are rampaging around the house all day? What do I do when I am in the Negredo? And, uh, you know, to, to go back to Jung as an example, uh, he had his personal introspective time in the mornings. And then in the afternoon, he did his work with patients. He stayed grounded in the realities that he needed to uh, face squarely. And and I, I think, you know, Deb, you're building on, on Joseph's point about just needing to survive. And, and Joseph, okay. I'm glad you brought that up about suicide, because I do think that some negredos are are darker, blacker, uh, and more depressing than others. But the negredo is the time when we might think about giving up. That's the danger. But often, Jung wrote that at the nadir, where the suicidal fantasy begins to rise, if one can muscle through it, that's the place where something breaks free and new life is possible. Some of the things that Jung did to survive this, as Deb said, was also to talk to himself about what he was experiencing. Mm. That he wouldn't just experience it and shrug his shoulders and say, well, there it is, which a lot of us will do. But he, he would write these down in notebooks and then he would come back to them and he would reflect on them and he might research uh, parallels in ancient literature and he would capture these feeling states and inner experiences in works of art and transforming our experiences into visual symbols helps store the quantity of suffering in an internal object, which then gives us a bit of breathing room. It doesn't suppress it, but it titrates some of the intensity. And one of the delightful things that I'm seeing very much on the internet is people taking on really marvelous little creative projects, um, things that they're doing from a distance, singing to each other, uh, creating games and works of art, and trying to channel some of this into a creative endeavor. Oh, it goes to um, what you said earlier, Lisa, about do the next right thing. Uh, whatever we do, we do with ourselves, whether you have a sewing machine and you can make uh, face masks for people, mm -hmm. or you can talk to yourself, practice that I heartily recommend, <laughs> uh, create art. There are still wellsprings within us that we can tap into. So um, because people don't have a lot to do these days, there's a lot going on in social media. And Dr. Aaron Balick, who is a, a psychotherapist and an author and the director of Still Point UK, he, um, he tweeted um, the other day, the psychoanalyst I'd most like to spend my quarantine with is, mm. and the choices were Freud, Jung, Winnicott, and Lacan. <laughs> and when I saw this tweet, Winnicott was in the lead oh and Jung was in second place. Okay. So I, of course, responded, you know, I voted, I guess you can guess what I voted. And, um, and then I retweeted the poll on the This Jungian Life Twitter <laughs> feed. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, Jung had pulled into the front. 
Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. And the final results of the poll were Freud, 11%, Jung, 51%, Winnicott, 32%, and Lacan, 6%. Ah, so we did it. We burn. did it. <laughs> I think it was your vote that just really. No, I, I think it was all our. I think it was all our <laughs> listeners over on Twitter who voted. I, I think we tipped the scales. So well done. <laughs> well done. Okay, and now uh, a dream. Hi, this is Deb from This Jungian Life Podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this Jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. This week's dreamer is 29, uh, a woman, and she is a high school teacher. And here's the dream. I was arriving to a commotion in a beautiful open space garden beside the university building where I graduated. As I was approaching the crowd, I wondered who it was that everyone was so excited about. I was carrying a sort of notebook and was wearing a sort of girly school outfit, which indicated that I was a student again. I was surprised to see a slender gay man who was topless and with a floral headpiece, dancing in a circular motion, or like he was just so free and flowing and everyone was hoping he would notice them. He was dancing backed up by three or four women with floral crowns and white flowy gowns. He was just so fluid and beautiful. Then he looked at me, and I knew he liked me. When his dance was finished and everybody had left, he came to me and said hi, and then we kissed. It was a deep and profound kiss. I have never been kissed that way. With our tongues doing the talking, we communicated to each other. He told me, why are you so sad? I said I was afraid. Then I awoke, seeing my sleeping baby beside me. And for context, the dreamer says, I just gave birth to my third child and feel like I'm being confined by the responsibilities of family. I also just started reading Man and His Symbols by Jung. And she says the main feelings were infatuation, fright, being torn, really liking it, yet horrified by the consequences. And she adds, I've always been fascinated by male gaze. They seem so fluid and courageous and sure of themselves. Qualities I wish for myself. Well, it seems to me that this dreamer is perhaps facing a a little negredo of her own. (laughs) And the albedo has appeared in this dream with all these white uh, and joyful images, like the breaking of sunlight, breaking up all the dark clouds. So it's very compensatory, isn't it? Yeah, but there's something dangerous about it. I mean, this man and this dancing man and the three to four women with him make me think of Dionysus and the Maenads. Mm-hmm. And, and we know how dangerous that energy can be. It tears you apart, or it can. It's certainly transgressive. And, and the whole having this passionate French kiss, you know, with the floral, flowered gay man feels very transgressive to her, but at the same time, powerfully influencing, opening her up to certain feelings, much as we were said in the beginning of the episode, the green lion forces these powerful, instinctive, uh, hungry parts of her personality, which begin to 
grab hold and consequently make a demand. Well, I'm back on what you said, Lisa, about the main ads and uh, what you're saying, Joseph, about it's transgressive. I, I see it as compensatory of that, that um, Dionysian rituals were not necessarily dangerous. They were also uh, spiritual and full of spirit and joy and dancing and celebration of spring and new growth, like going to a big party, let's say, uh, to put it in, in modern language, going on spring break to Miami Beach. And so I, I wonder if something in the psyche has come in an erotic and healing way to compensate for and provide some hope to a dreamer who's going through a difficult time. And it's hard having a young family, just given birth to a baby. Some infusion of this kind of Dionysian energy may be exactly what is needed. Well, I agree it may be needed, but I also think, you know, she talks about horrified at the consequences. So this may be just the thing that's needed, and it may bring tumult with it. I'm noticing that she's 29, and now she has three children, which is, mm -hmm. to me, that's, you know, that's, that's a lot by 29. But, you know, 29 is around that time of that age 30 transition, or we've talked about before on the podcast, the Saturn return. And, and there's a way that she may be evaluating her life and the choices that she's made and recognizing that um, she's, you know, she has made some choices that have limited future options, as we all need to. But it can be a, a heavy thing to take that on board and to realize she doesn't have the freedom and the fluidity right now in her life. Uh, in her lived outer experience as this male dancer. No, she doesn't have that freedom. I, I agree completely with that. Um, but somewhere in the psyche, it is still there. I think this idea that the mother complex or the mother archetype that I imagine is powerfully constellated in her by virtue of having three young children, but also even being a high school teacher, which she notes and professionally caring for children is being given some space or being pushed aside a little bit in the compensatory nature of the dream, as you had said, Deb, that she's allowed to experience herself in the role of the lover or in the role of the young maiden who is, you know, acting impulsively to this display of beauty in front of her, which allows her to then perhaps go back to the various maternal roles she has with a little sigh of relief and a reminder that she is not just a mother figure in all these roles. I think it's interesting that it has her going back to her school where she graduated and she's mm -hmm. got a notebook and a kind of a girly um, uh, uniform, school uniform. So it really, she's back in the role of student. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, a, a lot of people have dreams where they're back in college or they're back in high school. And it was, we're going back to an earlier developmental phase. And maybe you didn't finish learning everything you needed to learn at that time. There's some unfinished business from that time. So I'd be curious if I had the dreamer here, I'd want to know uh, what what was that uniform from? Was it uniform from college? And what what got put aside back then? Mm -hmm. What what didn't get fully lived out back then that maybe is making a reappearance now? Uh, and I'm thinking, okay, if, we're, if you're back uh, with your notebook and in school and a student, what is it that you need to learn? Um, you know, von Franz has this great sentence about uh, the psyche doesn't waste much spit telling us what we already know. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so I would be curious about... What is it that she needs to learn? Well, it seems that there she is at school and she's not going to class and taking notes. But perhaps what she needs to learn is how to dance and how to have her erotic spirit uh, brought, brought to life. In the midst of all of the, the dailiness of taking care of a, a newborn baby and presumably they couldn't be very old, but uh, an active young family, which is burdensome and just hard. 
I'm also thinking another way to understand this dream is in terms of an activated archetype. And we've sort of said, well, maybe it's Dionysus. You know, it's like the God has appeared. <laughs> the God has appeared and he's going to have his way with you one way or the other. And what we know from Greek tragedy is if you resist the relationship with the God, then you will be torn asunder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that yeah. her embrace of the God is a really good sign because she could have fled. Yes, yes, that's a good point. One way to put this into a category, referencing our alchemical discussions earlier, is that the, the dancing male figure could be seen as a symbol of Mercurius. And for the alchemists, when they were in their laboratories watching how these various substances interacted and they would turn colors and vaporize, they were trying to imagine what the motive force was to make all these things happen. And then they supposed an idea that there was a spirit that was animating all of these things that could show up in innumerable fours and in innumerable forces that was an activating phenomena. And so Jung came to think a lot about the idea of Mercurius and thought of it as God's capacity to take on innumerable forms and yet remain himself and present in the dream as precisely what is required with that corona of numinosity. And I think that this male figure, whether we think of him as Dionysus or Attis or Adonis or maybe the risen Osiris, he's still in that category of Mercurius. And even the impishness and transgressiveness, which is also associated with Mercurius's presence in the dream. So I, it all points to something rather wonderful if she can embrace it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm interested in um, the kiss. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of things that could have happened. You know, she could have joined the dance. So, you know, all kinds of things could have happened. But what happens is this very specific kiss where she says it's a deep and profound kiss. I have never been kissed that way with our tongues doing the talking. We communicated to each other. And, and uh, that is when he told me, why are you so sad? So there is some uh, exchange communication of that, that this erotic intimacy and in the kiss, there's there's no separation. There's a real merger. Um, but we're ta we're not talking about intercourse. We're talking about a kiss uh, that brings forward um, his awareness or two parts of her own psyche, this male guy and and her dream ego that lifts into uh, a, a new kind of conjunctio, her sadness. And I'm thinking, oh, what, is, what is a a kiss? And it seems to me the kisses are more soulful. Uh, we do it with our heads. Our, our there's a consciousness, you know. Our our mouths have so many communicative and uh, other kinds of functions that there's something about that. This is how this conjunctio takes place. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a lovely image of of a specific kind of union, isn't it? He says, "Why are you so sad?" And then she says, "I'm afraid." And I think if I had the dreamer here, I would want to know, "What are you afraid of?" Or what were you afraid of in the dream? But that seems like where the dream ends. So somehow that's an important important question. I'm holding the image of the kiss again, Deb, and I'm thinking about how a kiss is also a transitional gesture. You know, in one moment, you pr you're on a date or you've met somebody and it's like, hi. And then there's all the kind of banter. But then with the introduction of the kiss is often the salvo to a whole other category of intimacy. And without the kiss, let's say to go right from hi to intercourse would be a little astounding, a little shocking. But to go from hi to the kiss offers this whole promise of what might happen with a, with a continuation of the intimacy. 
So the kiss to me is that wonderful transitional realization mm -hmm. of possibility and erotic conjoining with this part of her psyche. And if it is a divine figure, uh, as all of us seem to be feeling, there's a possibility of radical transformation. Jung felt both excited and sober about images of the divine that manifest in the psyche, that when the ego is being courted by a force of that magnitude, we can imagine that powerful and inescapable demands are likely to rise up. This can lead to tremendous transformation and a movement towards authenticity, but that transformation can come at a cost and require a, an awful lot of surrender to change. Mm -hmm. Yes. The kiss here um, evokes in me a response of uh, that it's erotic, um, but there's also something very soulful uh, and, and a kind of sacredness about it because it brings into uh, awareness the sadness as well. The two parts of her uh, communicate. The, the erotic part that is represented by the gay man dancing shirtless and the dream ego part. Of the, there's a real exchange here, a real a, a felt and soulful uh, connection uh, that's also infused with a lot of erotic energy. And I think, I think it's a really beautiful and encouraging lysis. I agree. And I, and I also am with Joseph in, and we don't know what the God is going to demand of her. Mm -hmm. And that may be why she's scared. And, and rightly so. There's a little mm -hmm. bit of awe, awfulness about mm -hmm. where this might go in terms of her own trajectory. In one of the associations towards the end, at least on a conscious level, she says she's always been fascinated by male gaze because they seem so fluid and courageous, sure of themselves, qualities that she wishes for herself. So this is the beginning of, I think, a very constructive salvo, mm -hmm. where she um, has an opportunity to not project those qualities exclusively onto other people, but to begin to claim them for herself, that she Absolutely. also has a capacity for fluidity and courageousness, and particularly in the dream, for that to be highly visible in the image of the fellow dancing in the midst of a, a group and everybody you know, hoping that they'll be noticed by him. There's an exhibitionistic quality, a performing quality that she's really attending to. When I think of her being both a high school teacher and being a mother of three children, I think often in that role, there's a constant sacrifice of narcissistic needs. And in the dream, there's this hope that she can claim something just for herself, that she can be seen as beautiful and uh, fluid and be seen as separate from all of the roles and responsibilities that she has, which sounds very reasonable to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think all of us feel very optimistic about the dream that it's a gift that might come with a demand, but that it's a gift. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.